going into child protection, there are no black and white situations, really. Everything is so gray. You never know what's going to happen. You're always gonna have times when you're making decisions for kids that it's gonna impact those children in negative ways going forward. You might take this work home with you. You might have a strong reaction to something that really scares you or you have anxiety. Those are real life things. I don't think it's something that we'll ever get rid of because it's just, it is ingrained in the process. I mean, it's gonna always be there that you're gonna wrestle with some of the decisions that you make. Guilt, shame, anxiety, rage, helplessness, hopelessness. These are some of the difficult responses that social workers may experience when their work on the front lines goes against their deeply held moral beliefs. Originally identified in war veterans, this soul-wounding phenomenon is known as moral injury. Researchers at the University of Minnesota have found a high incidence of moral injury in child protection in both clients and social workers. In this video, we'll be focusing on the effects of moral injury on workers. You'll meet three social workers at different stages of their careers, learn about how moral injury happens, what it feels like, and how to cope with it. So the concept of moral injury definitely resonates. I very deeply believe in upholding community safety and moving away from calling cops and moving away from especially treating our clients as they are criminals. Sarah goes out of her way to protect her clients from what she sees as unnecessary police involvement. In one case, when there seemed to be no other alternative, she personally drove her client who was struggling with a mental health crisis to the hospital. But her principles were challenged recently on a home visit to check on an 18-month-old child. I was knocking on the door, please let me in, I need to see you, I need to see you, baby. And I stayed there for an hour, just trying to be like, I haven't seen you for a month, I know that you, your, your phone broke, like, please let me in. After Sarah heard an unfamiliar voice instructing the parent not to let her in, she knew she had to reconsider her least desired approach. I consulted for literally an hour and a half and with my supervisor and with three different coworkers and a lot of tears. Um, I did have to call the police. The absolute horrendousness of that decision because it goes against my beliefs and having to reconcile what does this mean for me as a social justice advocate? What does this mean for me as a social worker? What does this mean for me within my practice and within my outside priorities as well? Child protection workers who've been in the field for many years may feel like they've come to terms with dilemmas like Sarah's and are less vulnerable to moral injury. But this intense emotional reaction to morally troubling events that challenge your moral framework can affect seasoned workers too. One of the things that I really enjoy doing are forensic interviews and tend to do a lot of them. During one forensic interview, a youth who had experienced sexual violence by a family member told Anne that she was afraid no one would believe her, so she secretly recorded it on her phone. I remember walking into it thinking, oh gosh, this is so great that we have this. And then as I watched it play out in front of me, I was just unbelievably caught off guard at how it hit me. Against every fiber in my being, it, not okay. Moral injury can occur with or without trauma. Because of what Anne saw that day, she experienced moral injury as part of secondary traumatic stress. In the days to follow, it definitely impacted me personally, where I was just, like I would be at work um, answering the phone or on the computer doing something, and then I, like 10 minutes would go by, and what I was working on was still blank, or I, was, I had not made progress, or um, somebody was talking with me, and it was just like they were talking, and I was over here like, I'm sorry, what? You're, oh, hi. Like I was just not even aware of how present I wasn't because I was so caught off guard about 
what was going on up here and thinking about what I had seen and then what I heard and then going home and like watching TV or doing something that I really enjoyed doing and still having this tap on my shoulder. I would lie awake at night. I couldn't fall asleep because my mind was just racing around and like going to all these different spots. And But it was all on that central topic and I just could not transition to a, a safe, less stimulating experience. The decisions I'm making are impacting families in ways that I know are gonna affect them for the rest of their lives. They're very heavy decisions. Returning kids into situations that I don't believe are healthy or safe for them is a really hard thing to overcome. But we don't make those decisions about when kids go home, judges do. For Carol, who recently retired after over 26 years as a child protection worker, Moral injury hit her most when decisions were made that she believed could negatively impact the children she was working to protect. That is something that you lose sleep over because, you know, you don't know a day on a day-by-day -day basis, are those kids still safe? And now I'm out of there and I can't get back in because our case is no, no longer open. You can feel pretty hopeless and helpless in those situations, especially when you feel that the best interest of the child isn't being considered. You can get pretty depressed about that. That's really hard when your opinion isn't valued. You feel pretty worthless. At one point, Carol considered leaving her job as a result of how this kind of moral injury affected her. But over the years, she figured out healthy coping mechanisms that allowed her to stay in the career that she loved. In dealing with moral injury, there's a lot of ways to rejuvenate. And I love to rejuvenate by going to my cabin, spending time alone in nature, having hobbies. I spend a lot of time with my girlfriends and have outside of work activities that I love to do. And um, sometimes I just crash at home. You have to fill your bucket with what you love to keep it from being totally empty sometimes. The University of Minnesota team sees a clear need to design and evaluate preventive interventions to reduce the incidence of moral injury in workers by focusing on change at the system's level. On an individual level, moral injury can be addressed in a variety of ways, including through spiritual resources or connecting with a supportive community of peers who understand and may have experienced moral injury. We see a lot of complicated issues and grief that come up that I think is just overwhelming. And so for people that are coming into the profession, I think it's just really helpful to absolutely find your people, but to make sure that your people are diverse and that your support people are people that have been doing the work for a while, in addition to people that are like similar to you in your career and maybe in your own personal life, you know, to have those friendships that kind of span over that time frame so that when there's things that you haven't come across, you can say, hey, have, has this happened to you before? Or what did you do when this happened? Because I don't, this is, I don't know what to do with this. Because we've all been there and it's not, it's not just you. And it's okay, it doesn't mean that you're weak or that you did something to cause it. It means that you're human 